<laughs> an appropriate side to begin the show with. Welcome again to Korea Business Talk number two, being streamed live on July 30th, 2011. Uh, we've had a few pre-show technical challenges, but uh, hopefully we've got them sorted out now. Uh, with us this week, this is uh, Jeff Lebo. I'm in Busan, Korea. Hi, Professor K from Busan, Kyungsung University. Uh, this is uh, H. Uh, Hyungsik Yoon, uh, director of uh, director of operation in Meraldine, Korea, in Pyeongtaek. Uh, and I'm Joshua. I'm currently up in Seoul. I'm a communications consultant consultant for Lam Institute, which is a corporate training firm around Asia. Back to and, you, Jeff. And also joining us for the first time, recent arrival. Oh, Scott's over. He says he's staying in chat. Okay. Um, Scott, if you do want to chime in, feel free. Uh, we have Scott Fulmer in our Hangout with us. Uh, so this is a collaborative effort between KoreaBusinessCentral.com and KoreaBridge.net. Our goal is to talk about what's been going on in the world of Korea business. It's been two weeks. All sorts of stuff has gone on. What is new? And for that, we turn you over to Chung Shi. <laughs> there has been many stuff going on. Uh, there is an issue about uh, uh, Japanese lawmakers trying to come to uh, Korea to visit Ulleung Island to claim their uh, right to own uh, a small island in uh, East Sea or Sea of Japan. And another issue is about uh, it's more of a labor issue where there is one uh, Red Union uh, activist uh, high in uh, Goliath Crane in Hanjin heavy industry. Uh, there is uh, a number of people visiting that Hanjin, inv uh, Hanjin heavy industry to support her. Uh, in a bus is called the Hope Bus. Many call it despair bus because of all the labor disputes. So those are the two main things that I can think of that's happening at this time uh, today. And, and well, other I things I think we might talk about, uh, Korea suffered one of its biggest hacking uh, episodes uh, this past week. Uh, mm -hmm. Cyworld and Nate, uh, I think 35 million people's identity or, or personal information might have been uh, stolen. Uh, we also saw historic rainfall on the peninsula. Uh, mm -hmm. More than 10 inches of rain, 12 inches of rain in a single day. Uh, so all sorts of news. Why don't we take them, uh, uh, and anything else people want to throw out there while we're uh, letting people know what's on today's agenda? Uh, the Jungan did a little report on uh, so that all the small businesses popping up in Korea. I don't know if anybody else read that. The expats blaze new trails in business. So I did I'll see talk, that. Yeah, it's kind of interesting little article. Um, for, and I get a little bit on Craftworks in there as well as on some of the uh, the DJs and the yeah. That yeah, definitely the be something. Maker. If we've got time for that later, that'd be great. Ah, cool. Sounds good. Going to Craftworks and having some nice beer, or talking about it. Talking about it and going to it. And going would and, be okay. And Scott's got an idea as well. Along, he says something of interest to him is that there is a recent announcement that the Korean government is going to invest 2.6 billion into digitizing the public education system. And that's true also, the, the whole increase in ebooks going on. Ah. Excellent. Um, and I want to encourage us all in the Hangout to do our chatting in the chat room at koreabridge.net slash live so we get fewer dings uh, in the audio. I am an audio nag for those who didn't know. Uh, all right, why don't we start with some of what uh, Hyung Sik mentioned. Uh, this Ulongdo situation. We talked last week about um, the flyover. Korean Air flew over Tokdo, and so Japan had um, told their diplomats not to fly Korean Air for a month or a certain period of time. What's the latest with the Ulongdo situation, Hyung Shi? Uh, uh, there was a, a Japanese foreign ministry decision not to fly their diplomats over Korean air. Now this is more of Japanese uh, uh, LDP, uh, who is now uh, the opposition party. Uh, they want to, uh, they are more right than left, and they want to make this uh, doctor issue as uh, 
a way to attract Japanese attention and they can tell the citizens that LDP is doing the right things for the Japanese employees by claiming the land. Japanese or Japan is in land dispute with China and in, with Russia. And uh, I heard from my Japanese colleagues in Merida in Japan that all many of the people in Japanese in Japan do not know about this issue. This is a very small issue to them. But uh, the Japanese lawmakers or the politicians want to make it a big issue. Uh, so what I think is if we do not let these visitors come to Korea, this will become an international issue because uh, the press can say, oh, Japanese, uh, Korean government is banning the entry of the lawmakers, Japanese lawmakers. Where if does the we, Korean media and Korean public opinion seem to be on this? Korean media and Korean uh, generally sentimental, they are speaking in hearts, not in heads. There is one politician who was a former ambassador to Japan. He is saying, look, let's let them come, let them visit doctor. If they have to go to doctor, they have to get a license or permit from the Korean government. If they do get the Korean government's permit, there's an admission that doctor belongs to Korea. <laughs> He's the only one that is telling from the brain or the, the head or with reason. Others are more sensible. Oh, Japanese are coming to claim the land or uh, Dr. Island. Let's stop them. Personally, I don't think that is a good idea because we are falling into their uh, trap. Because this will become an international issue by being pressed, as, by being uh, publicized as Korean government is banning the entry of Japanese lawmakers. Big story. Yeah, instead of using good sense, they're a little bit too emotional, I guess, huh? Correct. Versus, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Is this having any real impact on business? You know, one of the stories I saw today is that um, exports from Korea to Japan are skyrocketing uh, because of that radiation-free Korean food. Well, I think we have to, to some extent, always divide which issues are just being used for election fodder and which are actually affecting the, the business markets. I mean... And that, that's true not just in Korea, but in, in the U.S. as well. Uh, issues over whether creationism should be taught in schools have little to no effect on the stock market, you know. So we've got, we've got two very separate, separate issues here. I, I think I would tend to agree with, uh, uh, with Youngshik that just letting them come is a much wiser maneuver. And that whole, I've actually, I've been to Dokdo before, which is, for all of 15 minutes. That's how long they let you stay on the on the rocks. <laughs> so we, I was out in Ulongdo, and it's it's two and a half hours, two to two and a half hours out to Dokdo, 15 minutes on a on a dock, and then two to two and a half hours back. Totally worth it. <laughs> <laughs> but Did it feel still, Korean uh, to you or more Japanese? I, I it felt more Korean to me, of course. With all there's a there were more than enough flags. There's one flag for every person in the island. Um. No, but actually the photos I, I took there were in a uh, UK pub publication on border disputes. Uh, so that was kind of cool. But no, definitely, I would agree with Hyunsik that just letting them come and getting that, you have to get that official, it's, it's not like a passport, but it's a, it's a certificate that allows you to go onto the island. And that's essentially them agreeing to some extent that the Korean government has a legitimate authority to issue that certificate. So the Japanese lawmakers kind of shoot themselves in their own foot if they come over here and legitimize freeing claims. All right, let us move on. Can, <laughs> can we talk about the rain? It was really, really rainy. How, how were your floods? Uh, you know, I live in Seoul in Gangnam, in Yeoksamdong. Oh, so wow. that was the epicenter of whole flood issue. Luckily, I left on that day, on the, it was Wednesday, mm -hmm. I left about 6.20, and at that time, there was, it was raining, but road was okay. There was no traffic jam. When I arrived in Pyeongtaek about an hour ago, all the media talked about all the floors in Seoul, 
in Gangnam, like uh, cars are floating, and uh, you know, Gangnam, Gangnam Dero is becoming a big river. So it happened just an hour, one hour between 6:20 when I left, about 7:30 when I arrived in Pyeongtaek. So it's like uh, I have never seen seen anything like that in my life in Korea. I I've lived in Seoul for many years uh, throughout my life. But never a uh, road becoming a river in such a short time. And it, well, it, it was it. just record breaking. I understood like 70 centimeters an hour. Since right. 1907, since record keeping began, it's the biggest they've had in 24 hours as well as three day period. I'm mm -hmm. curious what you think, Hyunchik, about the, uh, the government's response to it. Uh, because there's been some criticism of that some of the problems that were caused with landslides were preventable. Right, right. I'm curious mm -hmm. what you think about that as far as the response has been. You know, the, I don't know. Uh, for me, it's more of a force majeure or act mm -hmm. of God. I, I don't know how city officials could have done better when there was uh, 70 millimeters an hour rainfall was falling for so many hours. Uh, no, no, they were no. talking about inadequate, uh, like a drain system. Mm. But, but no uh, drain for 100 year, right. 100 year rain. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and spend the all that money preparing and people complain about it, right? Oh, well, yeah, that's actually true. Uh, just to make a comparison, um, the, the storm walls they had that they had built, they'd spent billions and billions on the storm walls in, in Japan that were designed to actually uh, prevent the, the flooding from tsunamis. And within seconds, they were overrun, these right. multi-billion dollar storm walls. So that's one of those cases where even if you do plan for the worst case scenario, it's not necessarily, even if you pump billions into it, not necessarily going to have any effect. Yeah. And more of the comments from the opposition party is aimed at current Seoul Mayor Oh Se-hun. Hmm. Okay, now Oh Se-hun is trying to have an election of, or, or the vote of uh, like a free meals to kids. There is opposition wants free meals for all the children or all the students, while the Seoul mayor says only for the poor people because of the budget issue. So he's a pop, he is a big uh, beacon against populism, and there will be a vote on August 24th or 5th. So if major, uh, Mayor O wins, it's going to be a big a victory for the current ruling party or the rightist, or the people like conservative uh, conservative people. So the opposition party is using this flood in Seoul as a tool to attack Mayor O. That's how uh, I, was, I see it. I'm a, I'm a conservative, yes. <laughs> True, but I, you know, I mean, is it, it's not really a legitimate complaint, but of course, you know, when you see all the damage, it's pretty easy to start attacking and using it politically. Um, hopefully, smarter heads will prevail, but who knows what's going to happen in one month. And overall, I kind of feel like Korea weathered the storm pretty well. I mean, there were some landslides and definitely damage, but this is a hundred year storm. There were no building collapses. There were no, you know, the, the infrastructure wasn't exposed as very problematic and cleanup crews got on the job and soccer games were held that night and and Korea went on its business. The subways had no problem which was impressive to me actually. Right. But uh, there's, there has been some criticism though for example with uh, the Four Rivers project um, and the fact that those construction sites like just just a few days ago they had been talked about how, how good they were doing and then three days later they're all completely flooded. So a lot of the Four Rivers construction sites are actually under water now. Uh, and R.J. Kohler was talking about that on, on Marmitzel. They had a pretty good article on that. So looking yeah. at the potential the potential fallback from that of being like, hey, look, everything's going well, and oops, now it's underwater. So some potential problems there. Can it be compared to Katrina in, uh, where, where was it? Uh, in uh, Louisiana and in, in the Gulf Coast there. I, I think it can be. I think, you know, it's it's that level of uh, 
unusual weather event. Uh, mm -hmm. And in Katrina, it wasn't really the storm itself that created the biggest problem. It was the fact that the levees didn't hold. Uh, yeah, the which... levees didn't hold, but also the, that the response, the, the actual, I mean, people, yes, it, that's one of those ones where could better have levees protected, you know, um, Louisiana more. And it's possible, yes, there's a lot of things there. There's there's issues with we're removing marshland, we're, we're removing things which are uh, a buffer to some of these storm surges. Uh, so the the pre-prevention type of stuff, just as in the situation with Korea or with Japan, you could go back and forth on that either way. You know, how much could we have done, how much could we have not done. The big difference has been uh, the post-response in Katrina was really bad. Like the actual response um, after Katrina was what um, Bush got really criticized for. I mean, people people were, were angry about the levees briefly, but it was the post-response that really measures how people deal with a crisis. And so far, I would, I would tend to agree with Jeff that overall, the, the response has been better here. But again, the, the size of the, of the damage is much, much, much less. <laughs> there's, no, there's no real comparison as far as the actual damage Katrina did versus the damage uh, Historics Rain did. I mean, so, you know, yes, they had a better response in Seoul, but they had a much, much smaller problem. And I did see a very funny article talking about how the administration deals with crises with different color jackets. And so after this crisis, all the, the administration was wearing yellow jackets in their meeting, which means <laughs> caution like, or something. I like, well, we're, we're big on color coding in the States as well. <laughs> <laughs> that gave me a really. Orange alert today. So, uh, you know. But no, but th there's, always, there's always that tendency to compare with other disasters, which uh, I understand simplifies things, but it can be a bit dangerous. Like we talk about, oh, well, this is Korea's Katrina. And, oh, not, not really. It can be dangerous to make these kinds of comparisons. All right. Anything else to uh, share about the flood or the rain? I really want to go inner tubing down the Chungaechon. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to share. It just, that would be awesome today. <sighs> All right. Next story. Yeah. We want to talk about the building shaking from table. Sure. Yeah. But... I have no idea why it was shaking, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone does. That's the problem. I'm a little scared that the building was shaking because of you know the employees exercising. Isn't that a bit of a concern? Uh, fill us in on this. What's what's the story? Wait, wait, what? I think maybe Young Chick could could fill us in a little bit better. He posted that in the Google Docs. Right, thing, right. So. What happened was about, about 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 three four weeks ago. Uh, the Technomart, that's a uh, 39 story building in upper uh, in Seoul, Gangbuk area. And uh, for 10 minutes, the, the building shook up and down, more on the upper stories. And mm -hmm. uh, people thought it was an earthquake, and people ran down. They were scared about because, uh, getting another Japan like uh, earthquake. So about over 3,000 people had to be evacuated for three, two or three days. And people didn't know why. There was no earthquake. And people thought about the bad building design or poor construction. Nothing wrong. So uh, the, uh, the scientists or the ar architects went in to investigate. And they found there was a uh, kind of a resonance from the uh, Tebo Fitness Center uh, where they had exercised and they were exercising to a rhythm. So, so it was, was like a 2.7 hertz, like 2.7 times per second was matching to the building's own the, 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 the re resonance or the hertz. So it was a, like, a, we call it mechanical resonance like the Tacoma uh, Narrows Bridge in, in Washington State. Right, 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 right. Same thing. It was a resonance kind of matching. So it was. So people were surprised to see this little tab exercise led to a building collapse or near building collapse. What if it exercise was a. Is dangerous. Big <laughs> vibration. See, so, I could understand if it was a whole bunch of big Miguk Saram, but how can Koreans cause that much of a sway? You'd be surprised <laughs> the way the sympathetic vibration works. Have you seen like the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse? You can see it on, actually you can pull it up on YouTube real quick. Just Google uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse on YouTube. And it actually fell apart 
from the slightest, slightest breeze. It wasn't a windy day. It wasn't horribly windy. But the breeze happened to be uh, blowing at this exact frequency, which created this resonance. And so the resonance just builds and builds and builds. And it's got nowhere to release, so it just keeps getting bigger and bigger until the bridge actually collapsed. And I can see Adam and Jeff simultaneously on YouTube right now. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely looking for the bridge collapse. It's a great example because uh, we talk about it with, from a public speaking perspective, we talk about resonance of the, the human voice. And there have been different studies of different acoustic settings where the more resonant a voice is, the more persuasive you are. Um, and there's even been studies with, with things like um, theaters and churches where the certain frequencies of resonance can actually cause, to some extent, religious experiences in the brain, a sense of, you know, real powerful experience. So resonance is crazy. I didn't know it was the exercise killing the building, though. That's hilarious. <laughs> I mean, scary, but funny at the same time. <laughs> Absolutely. I did not hear that follow-up on that, actually. That's awesome. Thanks for letting me know. But most of the fitness centers, we, we wondered why the other buildings that have fitness centers do not have this type of uh, vibration or resonance. And most of the buildings have their fitness centers under the ground, not in the middle of the ground, middle of the building. So the fitness center at Technomart, uh, Technomart was on the 12th floor. Boy, I so hate to live on the 11th the reason, floor. Mm -hmm. So then maybe the reason why other buildings did not have that type of uh, vibration and Technomart Techno had. Yeah, usually they're much lower in the building. Right. Underground My, or like second floor, really. See, now you got me worried. My fitness center is on the top floor of the building I go to. <laughs> Change fitness centers, Jeff. No, no, it's, it's only a five-story building. I don't think we're oh. going to vibrate that thing. <laughs> True. All right. Oh, Next. yeah, and Dulcet Dan on the Career Bridge Live is actually he's posting about the the uh, department store collapse that was caused by the swimming pool. All right. Although that was caused by, that was an actual architectural issue, if I'm not mistaken, that they had just not planned for the volume of the water and had been like, hey, we can put a swimming pool here. This isn't the Sampung department store. Yeah, he's, he's probably just, it's a uh, right. Korea right. by the Sampung department store collapse. But that's, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's, um, that wasn't resonance, that was just bad structural planning, if I'm not mistaken. And also, like, air conditioner units on the top, on the roof or something, I think, played a role yeah, in that. Scott, Scott just put it, yeah, the contractors took bribes and the construction was substandard. I think mm -hmm. a lot has been improved since then. Obviously, there are still things that slip through. Mm -hmm. uh, like although, I, I'm really curious to see anything more about the acoustic vibration, the resonance <laughs> of the... Uh, you know, and I, I think that's sort of a, a pivotal point here in, in the whole discussion of the flood is how does Korea's infrastructure rate these days? Because right after the departments or right around that time, there's also a bridge collapse and there was a lot yeah. of concern about, you know, how quality are things built in uh, Korea. And like I said, I think the flood, it survived it pretty well. But at the same time, we're getting reports about problems with the KTX, Korea's express train, not so much the train itself, but the track. Apparently, who knows anything about that? Um, I actually got to meet with some of the, the French engineers that they had over here uh, helping out with that. Uh, and they said, actually, that they were very worried a number of years ago, but these days, less so. I get, But this is, again, hearsay from one French engineer that I happened to, to meet at a, a wine event. So that one French engineer is more, more happy with the situation now, but I, I don't know. <laughs> So obviously that's a definite that's a, a definite valid valid uh, source. <laughs> I'd be curious to hear if anybody actually has any real information along those lines. I know that during the rains, a few of the, the some of the smaller rail bridges got knocked out, but I mean that's not surprising given the extent of the flooding. The the recent uh, KTX train problems are occurring uh, more with. Uh, Korean-made Sanchan. Those yeah. trains were built by uh, uh, Hyundai Rotem. Hmm. So uh, we hear that uh, Hyundai Rotem was pressed uh, for quicker delivery, so they had to make trains at a very fast speed. Then was then had to be uh, then the normal. 
so there are some faulty parts or defective parts that went in start the train and the government Korean government audit team is going to invest the core rail the, the train service uh, national um, uh, the government company uh, core rail and uh, try to find out why the trains are having such problems so there will be a pretty deep digging into the matter to the train or the uh, 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 railway system and China's had similar problems just in the last week or so. Mm -hmm. You've seen the news there where they've had some, uh, they had a major, rather major rail disaster caused by uh, problems in the trains. It was a collision, correct? One train uh, ran in the back of the other one? Pulled it up right now. But there were some safety issues that had occurred. And mm -hmm. I'm just spouting off from things I read on Google News. I've got to actually look it up again. If I recall, one of the trains stopped, and then the other train just sort of kept going and ran to the back of it. If, if yep, I that's the, correctly. Yeah. So, this makes me wonder some of those things that you keep hearing about the long, the, the short lead times in this, you know, these contracts. Well, it's got to be done now. It's got to be done now, and you know, inevitably, there's some problems further down the road. Are they unrealistic lead times, or what? That's a good question. <laughs> I know from an editing perspective, it's always unrealistic lead times. Right? You know, well, Korean always go for Bali Bali. You know, that is how, and, you know, that is, uh, we think that came from Korean War. You know, people who had, had to be run away, uh, everyone has to be Bali Bali. Then the Korea need to grow fast economically, so everything has to be Bali Bali. Hmm. But traditionally, uh, Koreans' attitude was slow, slow, or chun chun because in the Orya, uh, our Korean proverb has a saying that if you are high class, you walk slow, you speak slow, you act slow. If you are low class or sangnom, you have to be fast. So our traditional way of acting or doing business was, business was slow, slow. Oh, now, right, after so. the Korean War, everyone had to be, you know, rush and hush, so Bali Bali. It's that old story, the young bun never ran, right? They right, only right, right. young bun never ran, right? yes. Yeah, yeah. Never ran. yes. Huh. How does that play out, you know, as Korea's Bali Bali culture interacts with demands of international standards in, in the business world, Young Sheik, when you know, Hyundai or whatever car company or major company is saying, okay, we have to meet certain international standards. Now we have to do it Bali Bali, but if you do it Bali Bali, you know, you might not meet those standards. How much has that become part of modern Korean training and things like that? You know, Bali Bali is one made Korean economy now. If there was no Bali Bali, we are still like a Philippine or Indonesia because in 1961, General Park jong hee took over and his focus was on economy, nothing but economy. So uh, he wanted to grow Korean economy fast, so he pushed. You know, the Gyeongbu Gosokdoro, Gyeongbu Highway, was built in two and a half years. Normally, it would take five to six years, that length. So there was a poor construction, there were you know, the uh, roads are kind of bumpy after one or two years use, but there was a highway. So there were pros and cons, but generally, uh, Bali Bali made Hyundai Motor Company number four in the world just after four years. We have never thought about Hyundai becoming bigger than Ford, or is now beating Toyota. So far, first half of, half of this year, Hyundai sold more cars than Toyota globally, thanks to tsunami in Japan, but Hyundai is uh, number fourth. But also part of that's because the quality of Hyundai cars has really right, right. improved. Right, quality is good. So I'd like to think when they're putting the car together, they're focusing on quality, not just speed. Right. Yeah, Hyundai chairman says if there's a quality issue, he wants Bali Bali correction. So everything yeah. has to be Bali Bali. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, it's, nice to see that, it's good to see that the actual standard of the Hyundai cars in Korea is rising up as well. I know that a few years back there were 
issues where Koreans were actually importing the Hyundai, Hyundai, uh, the Genesis right, from the U.S. Right. Yes, correct. Because mm. because it was considered to be a higher quality than the, the local version, <laughs> which is just that's just funny to me completely. <laughs> as far as safety goes and everything, so. Mm. Yeah, well, they're they're well known in America now in Canada as high quality cars or relatively high quality cars for the price well, that they're right. being sold yeah. at. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is great. I, I think you know Bally Bally, as Young Chick said, got them where they are. But I think it's going to be quality that takes them further. Oh well, yeah, they're also going to be a, down a little bit. Pause and reflect on, and this is something that's occurring in China and a bunch of other places as well. Is, uh, for example, if you go architecturally speaking. You can see actually in Korea now we've got better, more interesting buildings being built, but for quite some time it was just these carbon copy Lego <laughs> blocks. You know, you know, these these horrible blocks. Which is I mean, that's fine as a as a temporary measure, that's cost effective. Uh, but at the expense of, for example, losing uh the Hanok, the traditional Korean house villages, a large number of them have just been wiped out. Uh we went from I think there was in the year 2000, there were like 2,000 Hanuk houses left in Seoul, and now we're down in 2011, down to about 900 of them. So we lost about half of them in 10 years. And so that's, you know, that's a, that's a partially as a result of Bali Bali because it's not as cost effective to have a Hanuk house. But, you know, we have to hope that at least, even just looking at tourism dollars, people still have some sort of desire to preserve their cultural heritage. Uh, speaking of Hyundai, Hyungshik, I see one of your other stories this week was Hyundai workers arrested for gambling. What's that story? Um, <laughs> you know, the, there were computers in production line so that, you know, during the rest hours, uh, they can do some internet. But uh, what happened was during work hours, during work hours, not the rest, rest time, they uh, went into computer and uh, did some illegal computer betting, gambling. That shows how many unnecessary workforce Hyundai has. Because there were people not working, but gambling, and it was okay, they were making cars. So uh, that shows, number one, is a very poor work efficiency. Number two, very low morality, because no one was no one caught it while the gambling was happening. So there are, I think, about over 50 people uh, got involved in gambling. No. Are there too many workers on the line? Sure. I mean, the same problem happened in Detroit, really, I, I would argue, I guess. But uh, you know, how, how do you go about fixing that? You know, when I first joined the Hyundai in 1986, uh, our, we call it work. Ratio. Work ratio means if there's a cycle time of 60 seconds, a worker works 50 seconds and 10, sec uh, 10 seconds rest. Huh. Okay, now it's about 30 seconds, no, not even sorry, about 20 seconds work, 40 seconds rest. <laughs> so what I call um, the Hyundai production line or Kia is worse. They put their production line into a library where they read books and uh, newspapers. Instead of working, and the union is there. Oh, if the, the, the I was in manufacturing engineering, if I push for like a better work efficiency, they say, oh, that's too much of a workload. So, Union Hyundai became a union company in 1987. So Hyundai can be said before union or after union. Whole Hyundai work ethics or the work culture has changed from 1987. So for the employees, became a paradise. For the company, a nightmare. Really? Huh. Uh, Hyundai I, is I now know, I don't know enough about that one. Uh -huh. Definitely. Did you, I, all I know that's even remotely similar, talking about work speed and stuff, is I know uh, the Ford Motor Company on their line, what they did is you know they had the assembly line going at a certain speed and then every month they would just slowly without telling anyone just slowly minutely increase the speed of the assembly line mm. and so just you know month by month slowly this is like to some extent legend of what <laughs> Henry Ford was doing he would just slowly increase the speed mm -hmm. uh, and weed out those who couldn't keep up with it 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not saying that's a good idea, but it's kind of an interesting story. <laughs> an Absolutely. interesting managerial technique. It's like, oh, well, that's one way to do it. Uh, non-noticeable changes. Well, it, nice. it eventually yeah. adds up. But, uh, but eventually, though. But then you can cut it back, and you're still doing more than you did at the beginning. It's a great negotiation. Oh, and we've got a, a nice one. So instead of gambling during lunch, we've got a nice one coming in from the... Korea Bridge live feed that Chrysler workers in Michigan reportedly caught smoking drinking during lunch breaks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I think I think drinking during lunch might occur in more countries than we want to talk about. Absolutely. Uh, moving along in our list of stories this week uh, is the situation in... Um, uh, Yongdo here in Pusan. Uh, Hyungshik, you had mentioned what's going on there with the crane protest. Uh, the uh, Hanjin heavy industry, uh, they are shipbuilders, and uh, they were losing business because of uh, lack of uh, competitiveness, because of a higher wage against uh, Chinese shipbuilders. And they want to close one of their plants in Yongdo and uh, they are laying off people. And employees got upset, or the unionized employees got upset, and uh, one of the union leaders, not heavy industry, not, Hyundai, not Hanjin, but Min No Chong, or the, the union umbrella group. Uh, she was ex Hanjin employee until 1986. She got fired about 20, Three, six years, uh, 24 years ago. She became the leader of the Red Union Umbrella. Now she went up to the big tower, or the we call crane. So she has been raising a sit-in for over 150 days. It's quite long. So she's the only one there. She eats there. She, she does everything on the crane by herself. So there are people giving her food through a, not ladder, but through a, what do you call it? Mm, wire and with bucket. Cool. Now, the opposition party or the, the leftists or the union members are trying to take advantage of it uh, by having a whole bunch of people gathering at their place and protest, much like what they did three years ago in Seoul with uh, uh, mad cow disease. So they want to use it as a political uh, weapon against current government. What's funny is Hanjin Union itself has agreed with the company to lay off with compensation. Now it's third parties trying to go in and have them instigate to fight. So this pretty weird case of while the both direct parties are agreeing not to have any more dispute, but third parties are coming in and poke people, hey, go and fight, fight. So there will be about over 10,000 people gathering today in Busan in a bus called Himang Bus or Hope Bus, and there will be a big clash between the police and those people union members and a lot of traffic <laughs> because i guess one of the roads to yongdo was washed out in the flood and is still closed and so they're saying it's going to be a, a traffic nightmare so i wish we had a remote reporter there now that we could call in we'll try to work on that next time yeah no i mean i, I mean whenever there's the protests in downtown seoul it's it can be a headache for the traffic but at the same time i'm glad that they actually that we're living in a country that they're they actually have the ability to do that so that's uh, a nice thing although I mean there's always trying to decipher whether the the protests are legitimate or if it's just uh, being instigated so there's 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 always two sides to it so I'd be curious to know more about this one if you, especially as you're saying both the union and the um, the uh, company itself have agreed on terms, uh, it seems a bit strange to have a continuance going on. Unless, of course, there was 
funny wheeling and dealing on the union side. So, again, I don't know enough to, to voice an opinion on that. No, I can't really answer any of those those questions either. I'd love Come on, to Adam, to you're, you're down in Busan. You must. Yeah, know. I, I'm just going to pop don't over here. Don't you know what's going on inside the unions? <laughs> inside the unions. I don't know. From all the things that I read, it just looks so much more political than anything else. I mean, so oh, yeah. no, trying to flex their power and, and show the other companies that they mean business. And this is just being used because they can. That's unfortunate then. Because, I mean, it's, so. it's, it's to some extent becomes a boy who cried wolf type situation. Like, Unions and protests are a really powerful tool if they're used judiciously. You know, if they're if yeah, they're used when there's something that's actually needs to be changed, needs to be done. But if it just becomes something where it's a political tool for people, like uh, political in the sense of running around in circles and just like look at the power we've got, it becomes yeah. a blue cried wolf kind of situation, and it delegitimizes the actual useful uses of protests. Uh, which is great that we do have that opportunity in this country. Obviously, not myself as a foreigner. We're not terribly <laughs> encouraged to join in with those. Absolutely. Just yeah. as well, we'd get escorted out of the country fairly quickly. Uh, but nevertheless, living in a society that allows that is good, as long as it's being used wisely. One would hope. One of the problems right. with the union activities is rules are often violated if people with we call large voice scream. So the one lady on on the crane has clearly violated law because she's in someone else's property. And the law should say you get out or I'll shoot you down. <laughs> but somehow we don't do it. Because that is that is because uh, uh, there was a big revolution in 1960 uh, against Lee Seung-man, uh, no, uh, uh, April 19th. So people were having a big protest in Seoul and all over Korea to topple the dictator Lee Seung-man. He was the founder of Korea. Now, in 1987, there was a big protest against Chun Doo-hwan and Koreans succeeded. So people say, oh, if we did not violate the law at the time, Chun Doo-hwan would be still be in place or his regime would be in place. So that uh, rationality or that, how you call it, um, that way of thinking is a background for Koreans. It's okay to violate if we have a lot of people. For it, or if the law is not good, right? Yeah, if the law is not is, right, right. If, if the law is not it, right, then there's no reason to follow it. Right, right. But but what you're saying is that now laws that are right are still being violated just for right. the heck of it. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Now no, I can totally understand that. I mean, I I definitely agree with the the former uprisings where the laws that were put in place, not all of them were good laws. So mm -hmm. to some extent, you have to push back against that, but. Yeah, no, if they're just violating it for the sake of violating it now, that's, uh, again, that's not something I know enough about in this situation to say one way or the other. But still, that would be unfortunate. Mm -hmm. All right, let's head into perhaps our final story, <clears throat> which is of interest to me because I'm a geek. Uh, this past week, hackers broke into Nate and Cyworld. Uh, Nate is one of the biggest portals here. Cyworld is the, it was the Facebook of Korea before Facebook, and more than 70% uh, of Koreans have an account with either Nate or Cyworld. And they were able to grab personal information, including uh, uh, names, phone numbers, resident registration numbers, dates of birth, even blood types, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a huge security wow. vulnerability. And according to this Korea Times uh, article, the line that really uh, caught my attention was, despite the purported high-powered encryption of personal information, internet users are at a loss what to do. And for those who aren't familiar with using the Korean internet, there are all sorts of challenges. It's still Internet Explorer based, and you have to usually download extra security software, and it's really inconvenient, and apparently doesn't work very well. So any insights into cybersecurity here in Korea? Uh, an insight into Internet Explorer, they just published a study uh, recently where it was 
done with over a hundred thousand users, and it was IQ results. Did you see this online? No. It's on my Facebook, and they found that the average IQ of Internet Explorer users was the lowest of all browsers. <laughs> <laughs> So those, so if you're using Internet Explorer, statistically speaking, statistically speaking, you have a lower IQ. Um, I'm not going to comment on anything other than that. <laughs> and I, I can, I'm going to post the link up now just so people aren't. Do you know what the me. highest IQ browser was? I don't. I'm going to. I can. I'm going to send the link in just one second. I'm going to put it in the uh, the live chat feed. I've heard there's nothing but loopholes in Internet Explorer. I stopped using it a few years ago, except for all the stuff I have to do in Korea. So it's on a whole different computer. I don't download any of that ActiveX stuff on my laptop, and I don't know. I'd love to be able to get away from it. love to be able to use Google Chrome on the Korean websites, but that's not happening anytime soon. It is improving, though, actually, because yeah. as, of, as of the summer, uh, not this summer, but last summer, ActiveX is no longer required by the government for... Uh, secure websites and a lot of the Korean programmers have been waiting for that uh, if you actually look at the the smartphone market is one of the reasons why this is transformed because ActiveX doesn't really work well on even Android phones or on iPhones of course doesn't work at all so to have these apps working they had to develop ways um, of having secure access without the horribleness of ActiveX and so this is one of the things that's been helping push the market forward. So I do think in the next two or three years we're going to see a move away from Internet Explorer in Korea even, which is one of the very oh, last bastions of IE in the world. <laughs> you know. Absolutely. That's, that's great news. Well, well, this is not just good I news for, for us, but um, most of my, my Korean web designer friends are very happy about that. I mean, they don't like designing for Internet Explorer either. No one does. So this is not a, an ignorance issue. Good Korean web designers don't want to be using it but the companies that are hiring them are still requiring this antiquated platform. Uh, so I think what we're going to see is more of the Korean web designers actually getting what they want, which is uh, a much more powerful uh, and global yeah. set of uh, tools. More flexibility and stuff, too. Yeah. 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 Well, they sure. can really showcase their skills finally. So they're very cool. talented web designers. And actually, the uh, KCC, the Communications Commission here, uh, is working with Naver, Daum, and Microsoft to try to upgrade at least away from IE6, which is remarkable. You go into so many PC bongs here, and IE6 is still the browser that's being used, and it's so... Microsoft insecure. doesn't even support IE6 anymore. No one supports it. Yeah, it's an evil browser. Yeah, IE6. I mean, IE, IE8 or IE9, I mean, they're... They're passable browsers. Like I don't use them, but they're not. They're, I mean, they're passable browsers. I mean, they're 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 doable. They'll work. I don't have massive problems with them. It's it's IE six that really. When we're talking about IE being evil, we're talking about IE six here. Uh, which is just it's it's a you know it's a ten year old browser. And uh, the way I put it to my students uh, back when a lot of them were still using them when I was teaching at Yonsei was, you know, if your parents gave you a cell phone that was 10 years old, would you be happy with it? And, of course, the look of shock on their faces, oh, my God, no, of course I wouldn't want to use a 10-year-old a cell phone, a uh, 10-year-old piece of technology. It, you know, it's, it becomes dated so quickly, and browsers are even faster than that. They get dated much more fast, uh, and yet people still use it. Speaking of PC bongs, uh, I saw a story recently that they have been recategorized as, what is it called? Uh, naughty entities or uh, uh, dangerous really? work environments so that uh, minors can no longer work there. So all the 17 or 18 year olds working in PC bonks have had to be let go. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they're now as, as naughty as pool halls and things like that. <laughs> oh, yep. That was, yeah, that was just posted up in the Career Bridge Live, the article about that. All right. Anything else people want to bring up before we head into the home stretch? I'm good, I think. I, it's an interesting article from the Dong Ailbo talking about 0.2% of permanent foreign residents have a higher education. So 97 out of 45,000 have a PhD or what was it, uh, some certification. 
Huh. Seems to be a bit of a concern amongst the residents and immigration officials. All right, well, you're a year and a half away, right, Adam? So you'll bump those numbers up. Yeah, I'm going to get to 98. <laughs> Always important. 0.22 percent. Yeah. Uh, 98 percent of foreigners in Korea are PhDs. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, no. 97 people out of 45,000. So 0.2 percent. Oh, okay, okay. Not even half of one percent oh, have PhD okay. or or certification or whatever. It's uh, professional but... certification. Sorry. Okay. I don't. <laughs> I, I you know. Well, this you know, is hot on the heels know. of the Norway issue, right? It's so. it, no, it's it's tricky. It's tricky because uh, economically speaking, a lot of PhDs can make more in other locations. Absolutely. Uh, especially professors, for example, PhDs. PhDs who are teaching over here, with rare exceptions, it's uh, because they didn't they couldn't get a job elsewhere. Uh, and that I'm number still seems flag, low to flag me. On that comment. I'm going to get flag on that comment. But it's well, a lot of the PhDs teaching over here are underemployed. Mm -hmm. uh, they they could be getting better jobs elsewhere. It's just not really. A, a, it doesn't really. The Korean government does not currently well support uh, international PhDs uh, within the country. No, very true. It's sort of changing a little bit, mostly through the uh, the national universities. But yeah, I mean, the statistics they also talk about is that uh, the average monthly income is 60 percent of the average monthly income of Koreans for all these exactly. foreigners here. So, yeah, no. So there's just you know the justification is not there. We have to raise up the the actual salaries to match international standards. Absolutely, Otherwise, but that would cost us money. Money. Yeah, absolutely. I live in Yeoksamdong, which is right next to Techstone. And you know, Techstone is a maker of Korea's private education. And uh, I see a lot of uh, you know, brochures from Hagwons. Oh. And many of the Hagwons are having uh, teachers' profile. And if you're not from Ivy League, your name is not going to be there. Huh. So I never knew there are so many Ivy Leaguers working in Techstone. In Seoul. <laughs> so, are they real Ivy Leaguers or are they fake Ivy Leaguers? It depends on the Hagwon. I do have friends who are Ivy League who teach at various schools, um, and they can actually make a, a ton of money with just even just with a bachelor's from an Ivy League university. They can make quite a bit just because they've got the Ivy League name. But there are also there are Hagwons that are just completely lying, where, where they're not Ivy League at all. They're not even necessarily. Uh, native speakers. I had a, a Russian friend who was working at a Hagwon and mm. she was required to tell the parents that she was from Toronto, Canada and that's uh -uh. what the accent was. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> and they were young kids so they're like, oh, so that's what people from Toronto sound like. <laughs> like, yeah, sound like this. I was like, ooh, sure. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I mean, her English is great but it, with a Russian accent, it, she definitely was not from Canada at all, mm -hmm. but you know, it's so there, there's a mixture. There's a mixture, young chick, of people who are genuinely Ivy League and those who are not. Right. Uh, but this is this is an issue we have in the states as well with getting international PhDs. It's not rewarded. Um, it's really easy to get, not easy, but relatively speaking, for PhDs to get a, a student visa in the U.S. is doable. But then once they've graduated, even if a company wants to employ them, there are are huge hurdles immigration-wise employing uh, foreign PhDs in the US uh, depending on what country they're from and this is just kind of silly we, we educate them to PhD level and then as soon as they've got the PhD we want to kick them out which is just like really what, 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 what no let's keep keep as many PhDs as possible in our country <laughs> uh, raise up that educational standard you know raise up the the work standard there so it's just it's just funniness immigration on in every country immigration has some pros and cons. Before we wrap up, I wonder if we can all chime in on a soapbox topic from uh, Korea Business Central this week. Uh, Steve was soapboxing about, you know, Korea is always trying to push its international brand through food. And they've kind of marketed kimchi or bibimbap or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? What Korean food is the best way to attract the international market? Food? I love, I actually like uh, it's not not a not a specific food. It's a sauce, uh, samjang. Mm -hmm. I, I like her. 
I like samjung on everything. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a miracle sauce. <laughs> I, I put samjang on vegetables, on on chicken. I make a uh, with pesto. I make a like a, a samjang tahini kind of uh, sauce. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of. Uh, I think samjang is awesome. So I mean, that's not a specific food per se. It's more of a, an a accoutrement. But you know, I, I'd I'd like that on the shelves next to ketchup. It's awesome. That's probably the best idea I've heard, actually. I love Sam John. That's a great yeah, idea. I, and I, well, Korean, a lot of my Korean friends are, are shocked at all the different things I put it on. I'm like, <laughs> it tastes really good with all these things. You're right. It goes well with everything from vegetables uh, to meat to... The way, I put it, the way I put it is I've got Korean friends who put pizza, ketchup on their pizza, and I think that's a little bit odd. I'm like, well, the ketchup goes on everything. It goes in pasta. It goes on pizza. I'm like, no, how dare you? But then I'm going and I'm putting Sam on everything. So it's, you know... We're always sacred about our condiments. <laughs> I, I like. I would like to see samjung on the shelves, uh, in squeeze bottles next to uh, next to you know mustards and ketchup. Anyways, that's mine. I like that idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if we're going to beat that idea. You've got. I've win. never been much of a, a food push kind of you know supporter here. They always they're always pushing food, 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 food. And to me, that's always a, a pull aspect. I mean, it's you know there's something I go looking for. Yeah. I want something. So, you know, when the government's spending all this money trying to tell me to eat kimchi, I tend not to. <laughs> you know? I really like the the Korean tacos we've got going on in the States now. I would like to see more of that here. Taco, I love the Boogie Boogie tacos. Ah. I've got, I actually have some friends in here in Seoul who have a, a taco truck that they run around. Uh, they're uh, Korean-American, and they have a taco truck they run around Seoul. So, uh, It's... Um... Uh, for me, uh, uh, pizza uh, was very strange. I first tasted it in 1982 when I was a uh, katusa in Yongsan. And uh, when I had it, I, when I had a bite of it, I couldn't eat it because of all the cheese smell. <laughs> now I eat it once a week. So it's a matter of how you get used to it. You, know, when you, you, you probably have a hard time eating kimchi when you first had tried it in Korea because of the hot tasty and kind of smelly. But once you get used to it, well, you like the doenjang or samjang, probably the first time you taste it, you, you probably had a hard time. If you were the first timer in Korea. Doenjang I had a hard time with, samjang I liked. It was, it was love at first taste. <laughs> yeah, for samjang it was love at first taste. With galbi and samjang it was love at first taste. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I always think one of the strengths of Korean food is panchan. You know, I just like that style of having so many different dishes served uh, and different flavors and everything. I would love to see that as part of the package. And I've always wondered about like a, a make your own bibimbap kind of thing. You know, like a, a salad bar style where you put together your own mix and toss in the sauces and... So basically like a, a Korean version of Mongolian grill. Yeah. <laughs> right, Mongolian. Absolutely. Because yeah. I had, they have this, those kinds of options with noodles in the mall now, where you put together yeah. your size. But it's but it was it's grill. too oily. Oh well, I think anytime you get it, anytime you get that kind of mass, you know, the 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 shopping mall style cooking, uh, that's going to happen. Uh, and there's a good thing on Korea Business Talk or on Korea Bridge Live. Celebrity chefs need to be on board, not just government messages. And that is, I definitely agree with that. And there's a lot of actual. There's just a couple uh, food bloggers out there now. Uh, he mentioned there's a mention of Kimchi Chronicles, which is a good show, as well as if you look on Zen Kimchi or Soul Eats, they're doing a lot to push forward uh, the different types of food and restaurants here, both Korean as well as international. Because I think Seoul, at least, I don't know what it's like in Busan, the number of restaurants and the number of food opportunities we have are growing rapidly. Yeah, yeah we're finally growing rapidly, which is nice. That finally. is nice. You used to I have did to go to Seoul have, to eat, the but, best uh, grilled cheese I've ever had. I had in Busan. Where is that? Uh, it was near Busan National University at a the time. There was a breakfast place that did amazing grilled cheese and tomato soup. And I love crazy Korean cooking. These are a couple of um, Korean women in Toronto who make videos on how to cook the different oh, yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, they uh, they inspired me to make my own kaktugi, and I was just an utter fail. I, I oversalted my mu, and I did not get the paste right. It's, it's a lot harder than it looks. I, I have a lot of respect for kakdugi. I am horrible at cooking every type of food, but I try nevertheless. Well, on that note, perhaps we should head for lunch. Okay, that sounds like a good plan. I am hungry. Excellent.
Well, thanks very much, guys. Thanks, everyone who's tuned in. Uh, we'll be back in about two weeks, uh, maybe the same time. Maybe we'll change. Stay tuned to Korea Business Central and Korea Bridge for um, information. Have a great couple of weeks, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.